Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Tulane Entertainment and Sports Law Conference. My name is Gabe Feldman. I am the director of the Tulane Sports Law Program and the co-director of the Tulane Center for Sport. Tonight, to uh, recap, to cap off our terrific event, if I may say it's a terrific event, we have a panel that will look at the impact of COVID on the television business, and it'll be moderated by Jeff Frost, who is a Tulane Law alum, class of 1989, the president of Sony Pictures Television Studios. And I have to say, I'll, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff, who's going to introduce the entire panel. But this is a treat for me. I think this is a treat for a lot of people in the audience, because in the law school, we don't often get to talk to the head of a television studio or multiple executives from a television studio, much less uh, an actor on a, a famous actor on a famous television show. So to bring it all together to talk about the uh, impact of COVID on television business and lots of other issues, let me turn it over to Jeff Ross. Great, thank you, Gabe, and thanks for inviting us. Um, I'd like to introduce the panel. Uh, starting out with Carlos Williams. <clears throat> Carlos Williams is the Executive Vice President and Head of Business Affairs and Operations for 20th Television and Freeform at the Walt Disney Company. Sam Lerner, I don't think he needs an introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway. He is one of the stars of the Goldbergs. He plays Jeff on the Goldbergs um, on ABC. Karen Tadavosian. Karen is the Executive Vice President and Head of Business Affairs for Sony Pictures Television. Uh, and then Don steinberg Gutro. Don is the EVP and head of worldwide casting for Sony Pictures Television. So we're gonna dive in. We're gonna talk a little bit about something that's very timely and something that's impacted our business pretty significantly, which is the impact of COVID on, on the television business. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a secret, but uh, in March, um, when everything shut down, um, it had a big impact on our television business, on, on the entertainment business, because uh, all productions shut down uh, all around the country. We had, you know, we, we have right now, uh, we have over 40 productions that are live productions filming all around the world. And at that time, we probably had 20 to 25 productions actually filming, and every single one of them shut down because of COVID. Uh, there were government mandates here in the U.S., we had shows in the Czech Republic that got shut down. We had shows in Canada that got shut down <clears throat> all around the world. Um, and there was no indication as it was with every other business and everyone else's lives as to when we would be going back up, going back in. It was a lot of uncertainty. Um, we at Sony, we immediately started focusing on how do we make it safe to return to production? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna get back into production um, as quickly as we can, but we also don't know when the government will let us, and we also don't know when it's going to be safe to get back into production, because the last thing we wanted to do was go back into production and expose an actor like Sam or anybody else on the set to an unsafe condition because they might get COVID. Um, so we spent a lot of time, we spent a lot of money, a lot of effort coming calls, which I think the team will talk about in a little bit. Um, that would allow us to go back into production. And you know, I'm very pleased to say that we at Sony were actually one of the first studio to go back into production. We actually got back into production by July on one of our broadcast shows, SWAT, which is on CBS. And of course the Goldbergs also was shortly after that. Um, <clears throat> so it, it, it had a major impact um, financially. It had a major impact on everybody's lives because when we did go back into production, it wasn't the same as when we everything was different. So we're going to talk about it. We're going to start with what the impact of COVID has been on the business, because our business, the television business has changed. If anybody, if anybody listened to the first panel, um, the two panelists there talked about how the business has changed over the last probably 10 years in terms of digital and how everything's going towards uh, streamers as opposed to linear television. Um, but I got to tell you, in the past year, the changes that we've incurred are, they parallel what changes you've seen over the last 10 years, just as a result of COVID. So with that, I want to ask the panelists, um, and I'll throw this question to either Carlos or Karen, um, tell us how the business has changed as a result of COVID. You know, in, in particular, you're both studio executives. How has the studio business changed? 
Karen, why don't you jump in? You are muted, Karen, unfortunately. There we go. Sorry, I, I muted myself. <laughs> that was going to happen at some point. Your, yeah. Perfect. I muted myself during your speech, so I didn't. I wasn't noisy in the background. My God, it's changed in so many ways. I mean, just one dealing with it, and 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 more importantly, dealing with it from home and and as a company together. And I've never been so proud to see how how my colleagues came together over Zoom and just taking a handle on how to move forward. So the business has changed in, in that we had shows in various states of production, some just starting out, some close to being finished, and every show was hit slightly differently. So it's just evaluating the risk of the shutdown at that moment, how we did that safely, quickly, efficiently, and then more importantly, how do we look forward as to restarting? And of course, we can get into that later, but as to what, how is it safe to get this back up on the ground, but as a studio where we're making episodes that are moving at a really fast pace, there are significant costs involved, as Jeff had said earlier, is how do you deal with this cost and how do you deal with your partners, co-production partners who you know are, are producing this with you and the network? And I think what I found, which is very interesting, and Carlos, you can kind of chime in here as well, is because it was so new to everybody, our network partners were too afraid to like make any immediate decision as to how they were going to help with costs until they saw what their counterparts were doing. And of course, every show was handled differently. The costs on each show vary, but it, it, they, are, they were significant. So it was a matter of, okay, what are they? We're shutting down. When do we vamp up? And what does that mean financially for us? Carlos? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And to piggyback on that, the costs of COVID are significant. Um, we weren't as quick going back into production, you know, at 20th as Sony did. They were, they really were um, industry leaders there. I think you guys started in Canada, um, maybe before uh, anybody else. But again, the costs have been significant. We've been ranging in the low teens, you know, maybe 10 to 15 percent of the production costs have increased, and the television business historically has been a single margin business, um, a single digit margin business for, you know, a lot of studios. So, you know, you can understand how when you have these significant costs coming in, there is, there's a lot of conversations to be had because no one is, no one was planning for um, the economics of the television business, frankly, uh, uh, to turn you know, upside down. And as Karen mentioned, a big thing that was going on initially was how are the different platforms going to share in the in the in these new costs that no one um, knew were coming. You know, for instance, a streamer license like an Apple, an Amazon, Netflix, that will be a the full cost license. So they'll pay for the full budget plus an amount you know above and beyond that. So that conversation would be normally. Well, you have to pay for 100% of these COVID costs because you pay for 100% of the budget, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't just a right conversation. Um, yeah, it wasn't that cut and dry, unfortunately. Yeah, it, was, it certainly <laughs> wasn't that cut and dry. And, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in after you, Carlos, sorry. No, no please, go ahead, please. I was going to say, and oh, then I'm going to throw it to Sam because while these guys are talking about the business side of it, the creative side of it, and it's the actors who actually are the ones that had to take off their masks when they hit, you know, cameras rolling. Other people were in the background because we set this, we made the sets very safe. Imagine playing in a, a comedy scene or a drama scene where you have to be six feet apart, where just three months prior you were doing it this close. And all that changed and the innate trust you had to have in the people on your show. And I'll throw that to you, Sam, because you've been working with these actors for a long time you had to know that not only were they being safe during the weekdays, but on the weekends, that they weren't going out and they weren't doing stuff, you know, that was going to jeopardize your health. Yeah, not a ton of kissing I'm sorry. for me this year. Sam, before, before, we, before we jump on that, I just want to make, there's, there's something I want to talk about just because it's an elemental thing about what oh, Karen sorry. and Carlos I talked about. No, no, I no, no, no. it's just no worries, no worries. But I just want to make sure the audience understands because I found that it, it gets a little confusing. Uh, for people, and that is the studio business versus the network business, uh, because Carlos and Karen talked about, you know, the relationship between and how they were trying to deal with a network and they were trying to get coverage 
for certain costs. And I just, just want to make sure everybody understands the way this business works, because a lot of people think that the Goldbergs, it's on ABC, so it's an ABC show and ABC produces it. ABC doesn't produce the Goldbergs. Sony Pictures Television produces the Goldbergs. Um, and so the way this business works for the most part is we as studios, so Carlos is Studios 20th, or Sony Pictures Televisions, we produce these shows. We develop, we produce these shows, and then we sell them to a platform, whether it's ABC, whether it's FX, whether it's Netflix or Amazon, we sell it to a platform, and that's a license agreement. So the business arrangement is it's a license agreement. We own it, so you know we're responsible for the production and the financials related to the production and the license agreement. And, and what Karen and Carlos were talking about there was when, when COVID hit, there were these costs that studios weren't expecting and, and they were hit with them because it was now much more to produce. And so that was, they went to the networks and said, you know, why don't you cover it? And Carlos was talking about a cost plus situation at, at Netflix. And a lot of these networks said, whoa, whoa, COVID's not our problem. We didn't cause COVID. So we, we need to figure out, you know, a, a, a sharing of these costs as opposed to, you know, what it is. And there was a big fight over who would, who would pay what. So I just want to make sure it's kind of how actually go to Sam because Sam has actually had to live it in terms of, of production on a daily basis. Before we do that, and maybe uh, whoever wants to talk about it, and Sam, I want to get to you, but just to give your, what you're about to say more context, it'd be great if somebody could talk about some of the protocols. Like what we, what I'm saying here is, to get back into production, we had to do things different. We had to make sure it was safe on the set. So we came up with protocols that everybody on that set had to follow in order for people to feel safe and us to go back and us to go to the governments and say, we wanna go back to production. Governments had to sign off on it. The guilds, Screen Actors Guild had to sign off on it. So I don't know who wants to talk about- some of the I mean, on, Protocol wise, about... What, yeah, what go we ahead, Carlos. Is we, we test people you know, for COVID, Zone A, Sam would be zone A three times per week. Those are the people that, it's the talent and the people that are surrounding the talent. And what we also did is we brought in health and safety managers for every show. We brought in PPE and we brought in additional people to clean and sanitize the sets. And what we also did was provide for additional days for more spacing, so prep. You know, people would come in, they would, if you watch a set, everyone's jammed together. So what we did was we allowed for more time so people could be you know, uh, um, further apart. And then we've also provided for allocations for pushes and shutdowns. So if there's a positive, a zone A positive, we don't know if it's a false positive. So we have to hold for a day to retest. So we had to add those types of costs. And then we also moved post-production to remote. So that came with an additional cost. So all those different things that we did you know, the protocols, the procedures and protocols that we took, you know, were, were, were pricey, but health and safety is it. You know, that is the most important thing for all of us. Because when we all look at it, if, if our family, because that's our family, was on set, you'd want them to feel safe. And it's also a weird feeling because we're all sitting at home, you know, in our, in our, in our and everyone else is like on the set. And especially when this is August or September of last year, it's kind of like, it, it, it's a weird feeling. You're like, oh yeah, everything's safe out there. You know, but I, I'm sitting here in my, in my uh, house and I'm not gonna leave for the next month. So, we, and we were dealing with those types of issues and talent also. Go ahead, Karen. In addition to what Carlos just said and all the protocols to make sure, again, everybody's safety was of utmost priority. One thing Sony did, and I couldn't have been more proud of this, which was having calls with our cast and crew ahead of time to, with medical consultants, experts, our, our safety people, to truly have a conversation about what to expect. When we go back, here's what it's gonna be. What are your concerns? Let's talk about them. And I found that that really, just that open dialogue before anyone went to set proved to be invaluable, completely invaluable because it really kind of made people understand, one, their safety is the utmost important, two, what to expect, because this is all new for everybody and how it's going to work. And I'm telling you, because I sit in on those calls behind the scenes, I'm introduced in the beginning, and every day I learn something new, one about the statistics, two, what to expect. And I can say that that was one thing that Sony did that really helped me think, 
wow, this really educates the talent, the crew, so people know exactly what to expect. And and to know that we were on their side and to know that their health was of our utmost concern. And it really made the process so much easier going into this. Sam, and you were truth, probably part of those. And yeah, you know. I mean, and so really be was told, an incredible you thing. couldn't force an actor to come back to no. work. If an actor did not want to come back to work as a series regular on a show, I would get a call from their agent or the manager and they would say they have underlying health conditions or they're just afraid of this or they're afraid of that. Of course, I say this, they're not going to get paid if they don't come back. But we couldn't force them. And our writers would take a look at that show, that scene, and uh, they would rewrite. They would fix it uh, because we couldn't force anybody. Also in casting, we double cast everything. And that means if I would get an email on a Wednesday about guest stars on SWAT, I would have two choices for every role. In case one of those actors got sick when they got tested, I would approve both roles um, you know, both actors for the same role, uh, they would go with their first choice, but if the first choice tested positive, we'd go right to the second choice. I think education though was imperative because we were, it was all new for us and we were all learning and for our cast and crew, our producers, all of us to be in that same call together to learn about it and to hear about the safety and the protocols and what was going on, I think gave everybody a, a huge comfort level that the studio was behind them that this was first and foremost about their safety and second, getting back to work. Sam, it why, why don't you talk it, about production? Yeah, go yeah, ahead and talk it, about it what felt your extremely, was. It felt extremely safe. I mean, like you guys said, we had testing three times a week. And then during that big surge in January and December, this past one, we were being tested five times a week. So I almost felt safer at work than I did at home, weirdly. And, um, Last year, when we, you know, when we decided to come back, I think I was just so excited to work and not be stuck at home anymore that I would have, I would have gone to work regardless. But <laughs> you guys made it very, very safe for us. Um, but I would say more of my personal life is what stressed me out the most because I was still living with two roommates back when we started in August, and then I ended up buying a house in October, so I was able to have my own space where I knew that I could keep myself safe and not be, you know, putting myself at risk and stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it, it really was kind of scary because I didn't want to be the one cast member to shut the show down, you know? And I, I felt that type of pressure just naturally of being like, you know, grateful to be working during the worldwide pandemic and, and have the job that I'm so, you know, fortunate to be on like a show like ours. So it was like, it, it was more just about really <laughs> minimizing my risk and like staying home and really keeping myself from going crazy so that I could just show up at work and do a good job. I have to and say Sam, it, was a real, it was real, I just want to add that it was a really big um, sure. thrill as you would read the paper every day and then nobody was going to work and nobody was making money that we in Hollywood were opening up and that dry cleaners and makeup artists and teamsters and all those people were starting to get paychecks. That was a really big thrill knowing that we were providing that to the community. And I'll, I'll always be grateful uh, that we were able to do that. Yeah, our crew worked so hard, by the way, like just it, the makeup artists before they could touch our faces, they would have to put full like made or sorry, not, full like nurse gowns on and the PPE and they had to have gloves on and they, they had to be really, really specific before they could even apply makeup or touch our hair. And so I felt like the crew kind of had a lot more stress than us because everyone was kind of catering around the actors because we were like zone A plus, which is even better than zone A. Um, and so it was, <laughs> it, it kind of, I really just felt like the crew was working twice as hard, but everyone was just happy to be back and happy to not be stuck at home, I think. Yeah, and as a point of reference, you know, there's probably 125 people that work on each show. So it's a, it's a lot of people. A lot of people don't understand how, how many people actually just work on one, you know, television show, depending on drama or comedy. Sam, since, since you're on the set, I, I, I want to hear a little bit more about, like, what happened on the set. Like, before, before I, I can tell you, you know, I'd walk down to the Goldberg set or any set on the Sony lot. And there'd be people just standing around. There'd be people everywhere. They'd be all over the set, um, you know, lunchtime. 
lunchtime that everybody would kind of line up and go to the, you know, the, either the, the commissary on the studio or they'd go to where the lunch is being served on the set. How did that change from your perspective? It was, COVID? It was I mean, for the actors, it was all because we are the people that had to take our masks off. It was kind of like catered to us. Like they would, we would give in a lunch order and then they would bring it to us. It was, I almost felt like a, like a prince because everyone was just making sure that we were like safe and that we were comfortable. And, and it was very, they were very strict about the zones. So it was before like the lighting department would go in and light the scene, then the stand-ins would come in and block the scene with camera. And then they'd, everyone would have to leave. And then when the actors walked onto the set, people already had masks on, but everyone had to have goggles or face shields also. So there were just very strict rules like that that kind of were all around keeping everyone safe. But I mean, actors, especially because we did have to take our masks off. Yeah, and I can tell you from the executive perspective and Don, I mean, you and I can share this, you know, pre-COVID, we would just walk down and we'd go on the set and we'd meet with actors like Sam. We'd have cast dinners, we'd do all those sort of things. What, you know, how did COVID impact that, Don? You wanna talk about that a little bit? Oh, well, it's just, it's the interaction. It's, it's the actors are now, they're in their bubble and they have to be to stay safe. Um, but because Sony is a smaller studio, um, we do tend to reach out to our actors and like you said, have dinners or see the JTP walking around the lot and high five them. And uh, we've lost that interaction as well. I haven't been to a live audition or a table read um, in over a year. And that was one of the things I loved the most about my job was going to the table reads, um, auditioning actors live, not just doing it on Zoom. We've figured it out, but- yeah, Explain um, that, Don. Explain what we're doing now that since we well, can't we're do doing now reads, is, you can't uh, do live casting are, sessions. Right. Actors are self-taping at home. Um, I'm sure the uh, uh, what people have bought on Amazon, they've bought these little ring lights and they've bought tripods and they're auditioning. They're taking their scenes and they're putting them on tape and they're sending them to the casting director. Now, casting directors will tell you in a way they like it because they get to see more people in a day. But uh, what we've lost is the ability to connect with somebody when they walk in a room and an actor to say, you know, I read this five times. I'm just not sure of the direction. Can you help me out? What are you thinking? What are the producers thinking? You can do that on Zoom, but it's not the same. It doesn't have that same feel. And I was thinking of when we were casting Outlander and we had cast, um, I don't know if anybody watches Outlander, but we had cast Sam before we cast Katrina. And then we had three weekends in a row where we flew women in from all over the, you know, the UK to do very romantic, very hot screen tests with him. And today you, right now, you probably wouldn't be able to do that. And their chemistry is one of the 10 poles of, of the show. So right. things have changed in that sense. I'm curious, right. Don, how do you question. get around that? Sorry, ahead, Jeff. Jeff. I was just no. to that point. What do you do as a casting director to kind of get around that? What other besides well, we're doing them on, Zoom. on screen? We're no, no, I know on screen. Like, is there anything you look for that's different that you don't get in person for that chemistry? Well, in person, you get uh, you can't, chemistry. you know, they always say you can't buy chemistry, right? When right. they have it, um, Jeff, you and, and your lady on the Goldbergs, that's chemistry. It, it, you know, it was your best friends. And then, you know, it just, it brought those two characters together. So we still have to look for that, but we're looking at it on Zoom. So for me, it's, it's a little artificial. Um, it's not, it's not real. It's not what, why you would go to theater. When you go to theater, you look for connection of two actors on, on stage. Um, but we're figuring it out. It, it's not it's not easy though. It's it's made the jobs a little harder. And to that point, Don, and you were I think alluding to this earlier for Sam in terms of chemistry with another actor. As Don said earlier, you obviously you can you don't oh, you're not going to be doing the same I things mean, you were doing before. In terms of being close. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank so, you. So it's it's so how, it's, it's how very. Did you react it's just different. I mean, especially our table reads, I feel like you rely so much on, on laughter from, you know, our producers and our writers. And it was, it, it, it almost felt forced over Zoom because it's like, everyone's trying to make sure that you know that the joke is working. And so, I don't know, I, maybe actors are just insecure already, but like when you're trying to be funny <laughs> and it's on Zoom and maybe like your mic cuts out or something, it, 
it really can like affect maybe that joke will be cut from the script when you go to shoot it. It's just, it, it really is not the same. The late night guys are going through the same thing because the John Olivers, the Stephen Colbert's, their home as well. And they, the only way you know if a joke works, really, I mean, you think people are laughing in your head, but you wait for that <laughs> laughter, you time that laughter as an actor. You, you know, okay, you, you know the beats till the next line. And when you don't have it, it's really different. Mm -hmm. Really different. Karen, maybe you can talk about like what happens when, because it's going to happen. You're, you're, you're filming in the COVID era, people are going to test positive. And Carlos already mentioned about how, you know, you get tested three times a week. Some shows you might get tested more than that, quite frankly, or less than that, depending upon where you are on the set. But if somebody tests positive, you know, what happens? What do you do with the production? What, what are the next steps? We, so depending on who that person is and what zone they're on, they're in, we trace who have they been in contact with and, and that kind of determines your next step. So if it's a zone A person and they've been in contact with people, you've got to stop, you've got to test. And often we've, we've come across, and Carlos said this, a lot of false positives, which, you know, the first thing you think is, oh my God, this is going to shut my production down. And they're truly false positives but it really varies depending on who the person is that tested positive and who they've been, been in contact with and when. Now, if you can trace it and they've never been in contact with somebody, the protocols are very different than if it happened on set and there were two actors and one of the two tested positive, you have to take a hiatus until you determine what actually happened. Is a positive a true positive? And if it is, then you've got to wait or, or you've got to quarantine. So it really varies on the person and the timing and who they've been exposed to. And I've been on so many weekend calls where we get one of those calls, we receive mm -hmm. the positive. And, but by the next day, you've traced it enough, one, to determine it was a false positive or the two, the person, you know, had it at home, never came in contact with anybody. And so it's safe to move forward. But what we have to do is, you know, often we talk internally, we have to notify our partners and take the right measures to make sure that if we return, it's safe to return. And if not, there's a hiatus to take until you can kind of backtrack and see what's happened and who's been exposed. And if nobody has, move forward again. Uh, so I think the hardest thing is those false positives because actors really feel, you know, oh my God. And then they get tested three hours later and it's a negative. But once you've tested positive, you do have to report it and the contact tracing has to start right Correct. away. Um, we've had a few of those instances um, yeah. on shows in New York, especially for some reason earlier on where people were having false positives positive tests but you've got to treat it as if it right. is a positive until you find yeah, out to that point you know, yeah go ahead jeff yeah and to no i was just going to say to that point we actually had a show in new york where we did we did the testing and 18 people tested positive and we knew that 18 people didn't have covid but the in new york city said well you've had 18 positive tests you need to shut down for a week we then retested everybody and everybody tested negative in the subsequent tests. We went back to the Department of Health. The Department of Health said, sorry, you had positive tests. So unless you can prove without a doubt that each one of those people do not have COVID, you're gonna shut down for a week. And we said, well, we did this other test. And they said, tests are inconclusive. Once you've had a positive test, you're shutting down for the week. We had to shut down for an entire week, even though everybody can, after that tested negative on every test and nobody ever showed any signs of COVID. But that's kind of the things that you have to go through. So Carlos, to that point, I'd love to hear about maybe some things that you experienced at, at the Walt Disney Company, similar to that, similar to the story that I just mentioned, if you have something. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's the same thing, Jeff. It's, it's repetitive. It is, it is, you know, the false positives made things, you know, so you know, so difficult, you know, we had to change vendors before because you might have changed vendors after, you know, what happened to you in New York. Um, so it's just, you know, those were the similar issues and it was tough because some people were, you know, that that's heightened emotions too, that you might, you know, um, um, be positive for COVID, especially early on. Now it feels a little bit, you know, different because people understand what it is, the treatment, is different, but early on, even the treatment back in September was, was is much different than it was today. So there was a lot more um, um, fear 
and, and, and to be able to mollify that fear, you know, especially, you know, for our people on our shows, it's just, again, that's part of the health and safety also applies to the mental health. You know, it's not just the physical health, you know, of our, um, of our employees and the people on our shows, but we, we had the same issues that you had and we had to deal with them the exact, you know, same, same way, because we were always going to err, you know, on the side of being extra cautious. And we did. Well, Sam obviously was a trooper and he, he, he came back and, and basically took risk in terms of coming back to the workplace. So that's, that's pretty I'm amazing. I'm very brave. I do agree with that. I am brave. <laughs> exactly. There was, there was one day where I had a six o'clock call time the next morning and I had food poisoning. So I had a-, a Oh, I fever. remember. I, I was so scared to call our COVID officer and tell her, I don't know if I have COVID. I'm freaking out. I hate this. I hate that I might have to shut the show down. She was like, okay. And she was so like calm about it. And she, they ended up sending a doctor to my house who was like, yeah, you do not have COVID. You don't have any of the symptoms other than a fever. He was like, it sounds like you ate something bad. It'll probably pass. I think we did shut for like one day and I was so embarrassed. And then we were, and I tested negative and it was fine. But those moments were definitely really troubling. Exactly. And, and to that point, I mean, obviously, though, you and everybody on the Goldbergs were great. They said, we're coming back. But there are actors. And maybe we can talk about what, what do you do when we have an actor who said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to risk it. I'm not coming back. So Karen or Don or Carlos I'd like to hear from um, your we, reaction. We about had like one of those it. on a show. We have eight series regulars, so you'll never know who. It was SWAT. We had, and up until the day before, he, an actor, it was a he. Okay, now I've given you at least six choices. Okay. Um, not was not it's always he, a he. <laughs> right, it's always a he. Was not sure that he just felt safe. Was just not sure that he felt safe enough to come back to work. And I got on the phone with Sean Ryan, who's a brilliant showrunner, and the actor and the actor's agent. And Sean said, I understand, I hear you. These are our protocols. Now, oddly, I will say, this is an actor who didn't show up to our COVID call and would have learned everything if they had. So that's why we really encourage actors to come to that because there's a lot of information shared on that call. And at the end of the call, he said, okay, I'll try it, I'll come back. And it's been smooth sailing ever since, but there was a 24 hour period where we gave him to say, you need to let us know because we need to write you out. Right. We need to write you out. I mean, that was, that was the choice. And, and to me, it's Karen, all so about what? education really understanding right. it. It really is the educational process. This is all new for all of us as executives, as actors. It, it, we're all learning. Every day I'm learning something new. And I just think yeah. that that explanation, everyone, the, the community mentality, you know, the one thing we always said is we have to protect our family. You know, where when you go home after set, Sam, it's you just said it. I would be I would hate it if I'm the one who shut down production coming back. So I really felt this group village effort that it takes a village that we're all in it for each other. There is no a me, a he, a she that there is an us. And we're here to do this together and get through it. Sam wanted to work. We wanted to work. We have shows to make. The audience wanted shows to see. And so I really think that education was imperative for Sony and I, I, you know, and the way we did it for everyone is just how do we proceed safely and how do we get our questions answered? Because those questions change on a daily basis. You know, we're all fed with this news information and, and things that are just so scary at times. And, and we, we got constant questions, but I think it was just that methodical education. We're in it together. If you don't feel safe, let us help explain it to you. And no one's gonna force you to do anything. You said that earlier, Don. But once yeah. people felt comfortable at and saw what we did on set, you want to show up. I also you think, you know, we learn, we see, and it's funny, um, who steps up and Sam, you're lucky um, because your line producer, Annette, is the best in the business and takes care of people like I've never seen anybody take care of people. She's amazing. And you yeah. would hope that on every show you have that, truth be told, is you didn't. You don't. And we've watched um, and we've seen some shows that have operated better than others. I can't say everybody's been perfect, but others have risen to the occasion. And it's been, uh, just like Karen said, it's it's been wonderful to see who rises to the occasion. Yeah, and Sam, to that point, um, obviously, and you said this earlier, you said that uh, on set, you felt safe 
for than if you weren't. And, and to that point, how did you, because on the set, we at the studio, we could control everything. We were creating a bubble. You know, we made sure that those safety protocols were there. We made sure people followed those safety protocols. The COVID officer would be there on the set if they saw somebody not wearing a mask or not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And they would make sure that that happened. But how did you guide yourself when you weren't on the set? Because that was something that we as a studio, we had no control over. So what, what was going through your thought process about what you could and couldn't do when you were not on the set, when you were at home or out? I have, I have a lot of like, maybe I just have a lot of crazy friends, but you know, I, people wanted to, especially when I got a house, like everyone wanted to come over and they were like, come on, like, you know, we'll be safe. We'll be outside. And it was, I had to just be a responsible adult for once in my life and be like, no, my job's more important to me. And, and like you said, I have so many people relying on me and I, I have to be careful. So it was definitely extra pressure, but I think especially the COVID officer made everything very clear about like what was safe and what wasn't, you know, even in our personal lives, they gave us, you know, kind of just good rules to follow. And, and literally like when I would step out of my trailer, someone was there to, to wipe it, to wipe the handle off after I touched it. It was like insane, the amount of protocols that were in there. And if I took my face shield down for one second, there was a guy who would come over, hey, Sam, I'm so sorry, you have to put it back on. Like they were, they were very on top of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, as far as my personal life goes, it was, it was tough, but I had to tell some friends that like, this is not my year to be a young, crazy guy. Okay, I'm a responsible person now. Absolutely. And, and Carlos, going back to um, what we were just talking about, did you have any situations where an actor or maybe a showrunner <laughs> said, I'm not going back into production because I don't think it's safe? And how did you deal with that? You know, I think we were pretty fortunate, frankly, um, that, you know, we didn't have, you know, a lot of those problems. And, you know, maybe it was because we went a little bit behind, you know, I would say other people. So there were already shows, you know, being produced. So that, that might have helped us. But again, it's, it's, it's to the audience. It's, we try to manage productions, but we're doing this remote for the most part. When we hand over a production to somebody and they're, you know, a thousand miles away, we really have to count on the people, you know, in that production to really manage it. You know, as much as we try to, you know, from our offices, if they're at home or if they're at the Sony lot or at the Disney lot, you know, you're, you're turning over a lot of control. And so part of that was, you know, at least for me, it was, we already turned over a lot of that control and it was just getting those people or the leaders, you know, on, on the show, the directors and line producers, as you mentioned, on board with the protocols and really, you know, getting buy-in from the groups. But I, we, we didn't have as many uh, of those issues, you know, luckily enough. I mean, again, it's probably because we were a little, a step or two behind. And there were already 20 shows, 30 shows in production that were working. You know, one thing I was concerned about and, and a lot of people asked, it was the holiday travel. Oh, um, yeah. It, you know, because people do want to travel, shows shut down, and what happens between, depending on where you go, where your family is, quarantine, that was kind of a hurdle, Jeff, if you recall, just because people do want to see their families, and they want to leave, and then how does that impact coming back, so we can, again, say, be as safe as possible when you're doing this stuff, and just be mindful of quarantine timing, depending on where you're going, but to me, personally, like, my heart went out to people, just because you do want to see your family and you do have to travel in the holidays, you know, shows don't stop. Now that's, that's also another topic, Jeff, and I don't know if it's on your thing, but we tend to at Sony because we are an independent studio um, and we can, uh, we tend to share actors. We know that it's gotten harder for actors to make a living on six episodes. Sam, you're those, you know, yours does 20 something a year, but eight to 10 episodes a year is hard to make, it's hard to make a living. And then you hold an actor for another year. Um, and we used to, I guess, not liberally, but we used to share actors. Um, if an actor came to us that really wanted to do or got another great job, and now we couldn't do it. We had to say no, because we couldn't have an actor go from one set, then back to our set. 
So that was something that I really didn't anticipate uh, having to say no to because I hate I hate doing that. I love to keep our actors. I'm still mad you didn't let me do Outlander. I really was perfect for it. <laughs> You want to wear a kilt? You, I'm I would like to do a kilt. Sam Hewen just barely beat you out, Sam. You're both I, Sam, but both Sam Sam's, just barely so beat you out. I know. Consider so me, Don. Close. I'm just saying. It was close. All right, we're right. going to jump some So that's just an interesting cause... thing that came up that I, I didn't I didn't factor into it, and we really had to say no to certain actors, and they were not happy. But ultimately, they all really understood. Okay, we, we actually have some questions. We only have about oh, three cool. or four more minutes. So I'm going to throw out a question. Um, to everybody, but it's it, it's from law school graduates and they're asking, or law school students, they're saying, where should law school graduates look for opportunities to break into the media entertainment industry? Basically, how do they get into the entertainment industry? It might be better for Carlos and Karen because they both went to law school, but you know, how do they become an actor, Sam? You can address that, but let's start with Carlos as to how, how do people get into the entertainment industry if they're a law student? Yeah, Jeff, Jeff is trying to set me up here because uh, <laughs> he was my first boss and he wouldn't hire me. No, I started off as a, um, a finance lawyer at, at Paul Hastings and I did that for you know a few years. I, I, I did the grind, um, but what it did is it really uh, prepared me um, to go into um, the entertainment business and then I, you know, I was fortunate enough to work uh, for Mr. Uh, Jeff Frost in my, uh, my first entertainment job, I, I didn't know what a producer or director did, you know, but I, I, I did know how to do a, a, a collateral mortgage-backed security um, um, a brief. So it's like, it, it was just, it was kind of lucky, but, you know, I was prepared. You know, I think that's more about whatever you go do if you want to get into the entertainment business, you know, get smart about whatever business you go to because the skills will translate. The negotiation will translate the, the way you, you, you go about your day, the ability to speak, you know, authoritatively about issues you might not know anything about, you know, all those skills you learn as you're, you know, a, a, a private lawyer and you're walking into rooms with clients that know a lot more about, you know, particular areas than you do, you know, as a, as a young lawyer. So I, I believe that those skills really translated and helped me to be, you know, successful, you know, at the job. So that's what it's more about is learning the skill set. People will recognize it. I hire people all the time that have different levels of experience. And it's more about what they're bringing to the table, you know, as individuals, less about, you know, they interned here, so I want to hire them. It's more about, oh, they have this interest, but they're really, they feel like they're going to be a really good executive. I'm looking at, you know, a, a possibility, not predictability. You know, I'm looking at innovation and I'm, when I'm looking at people, it's not about this specific thing you've done. It's about who you are. You know, I think my computer just froze for a second. Did Karen? you kick it to me, Jeff? Okay. You know, I was fortunate enough. I also Yes, I kicked it to you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough. I started out as a litigator. Um, but early on, I realized, you know, right out of law school, I hated this. And, and I always loved entertainment. And I, I found I didn't know anything about business affairs, but I found a way to, you know, combine my passion, which was for television. I just love television and my law degree. And I, I stumbled on business affairs and I, I did a lot of networking. I was fortunate enough to, to be introduced to somebody and, and help launch Fox Family Channel at an early age. So my career path led me to Sony. I've been at Sony 17 years. My takeaway from this is there is no one path. If you're passionate about something and you've got the skill set and you want it, there's a lot of different avenues, whether you started an entertainment firm, whether you started a small production company, or you started a law firm that has nothing to do with entertainment. It's just um, recognizing this is what I want. I'm going to go for it. That door might not always be easy, but I would never you know, say, don't give up. There is no one path. Do what you can. Follow your passion. And it's a skill set of negotiating and learning. And, you know, you can do it on the job. You can have great mentors like Jeff or Carlos to teach you along the way. Um, so if you want something, you just go for it. 
with that, unfortunately, I think we're at, I mean, Don and Sam, if you want to figure out how they got there, you have to be talented because I think they both started out as actors. So you have to have talent. So I don't know if there's any easier way. Um, but I, I, I think we're t it's time to wrap up. It's seven o'clock, a little bit afterwards. So I want to thank this incredibly distinguished panel. Uh, you guys did an amazing job. And I wish we had time for more questions because I know there's a lot of other questions. But I uh, want to say thank you. And thank you to the entire Tulane University and the law school uh, participants. It's, it, this has been a great opportunity and a great honor for us. So thank you. And I want to add that uh, I saw a question come in that if we were in New Orleans, where would we have been going to dinner? And the answer would have been, beside Jeff Frost being president of Sony, he's president of entertainment when we go to New Orleans. So he just would have picked the restaurant. <laughs> We, so we, we would we, we'd probably be a command we'd probably be a commander's palace you right? still want the commander's yes, palace but... <laughs> Ooh, or pesh i like pesh uh, oh yeah it's really good yes yes went there once years ago <laughs> absolutely absolutely august possibly august but anyway i think that <laughs> all right guys i think we're done i think they they they're, they're they playing music off. on thanks, us right guys. now thanks guys <laughs> Thank you. Lovely to meet the ones Thank I didn't you so know. Much. Thank you, Sam. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, Thank guys you, guys. Having... Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Carlos, Sam, Karen, Don, who already left. Thank you, guys. Of course. Thank you, Jeff. Really important.